Can we began by declaring by reading the word of the Lord that spoke of God, uh, His hand in our lives, in our world, and that ended with Christ above all. And it's again so easy to lose sight of that. That's why we come together here, is to, and that's why we have read our word and we pray and we walk with each other. But we come together today to encourage, to strengthen, to worship in the name of the Lord. And um, today we're going to hear from two different uh, people, for one thing, but two different ministries um, that are seeking to um, continue the work of the Lord in, in areas that are not easy and are often very dark. Um, and they're bringing, seeking to bring light in the midst of it. So the first one is Emma and her sidekick Lois. Uh, just over a year ago, Lois was here, uh, met with some of us uh, and, and from the area, not just our church, where uh, with a heart from some of them who came, who said, we would like to see um, a uh, pregnancy crisis Pregnancy Care Center um, ministry in Grand Forks, we think there's a need, and journey forward, and now Emma has the burden of making sure that happens, no, um, of, of being the first executive director of, of this ministry, and she's here to simply let us know about it, and um, hopefully to let us know how we can participate if you are... Um, Wanting us to, um, I'm assuming you should do, um, in different ways. So, welcome, and go for it. Just give me a minute here. Oh, it is. It's, her name is Emma Hoover, not Mila. Hoover vacuum, Mila vacuum. Oh. It's the standing joke back in England, you know. They all laugh at me yes. because in, in England we call all vacuums a Hoover. So. Yes. yes. So she is going to clean up. So I'm going to share screen. Oh, you, oh, you, oh, you, look at that. You know what you do. There, how's that? Sorry, I'm singing a bit here too. That's me, actually, or something. So, good morning, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to come and speak today. As has already been said, my name is Emma Hoover, and I am the new Executive Director of the Developing Pregnancy Care Centre, which is based in Grand Forks. I'm very excited to come here today. This is actually the first time I've shared with the church, so bear with me a little. Um, but I want to share with you a little bit about what we see pregnancy care work being, why we feel called to do this in the Boundary Region, and why we would love for you to be part of this um, work with us. So, who are we? Boundary Pregnancy Care Centre is a Christian-based organisation that aims to support anyone in the Boundary region who is facing an unexpected pregnancy. We believe that the life of every woman, man and child has value. And just as Jesus ministered to those who were sick, hungry, and lost. We want to demonstrate God's love and grace to men and women facing an unexpected pregnancy in our communities, whatever their background or beliefs. So why is this needed in the boundary? The Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada state that half of all pregnancies today are unexpected. I know, it's a, it's a high figure, isn't it? The reality is that at the moment of any positive pregnancy test, the lives of those involved are radically changed. For many, it is a joyful time, something they have planned, 
but sadly, as you see here, for half of men and women involved, it can feel like their lives are over and not the reward that's talked about in Psalm 127. In this case, there are three choices that a woman can make. She can choose to parent her child. She can choose to lovingly choose another family to raise that child. And thirdly, she can choose to abort that child and to end the life of it. None of these options are easy. And for many, the decision isn't straightforward. There are often pressures from friends, families, partners to make a particular choice. And other factors such as income, culture and religious beliefs may all influence the decision that she makes. Each one of these will ultimately affect both the mother and the baby. But it may also ripple out to involve the father, other family members and even friends. Sorry. A study in North Carolina actually found that 64% of women make that pregnancy decision within the 72 hours following a positive pregnancy test. So how does this relate to the Boundary Region? At present, there is one options clinic based in Grand Forks, which opens just twice a month in the evening. And it, we all know here, it can be challenging to get a doctor's appointment in a timely manner. Boundary Pregnancy Care Centre wants to open at least three times a week initially to provide a safe, non-judgmental place within that 72-hour period and beyond where men and women have the opportunity to receive accurate information on their pregnancy options, to talk about their fears and concerns, to work through decision-making tools and to have the opportunity to complete a free pregnancy test if they haven't already done so. All of these things allow the woman to make an informed choice that aligns with her beliefs and values. If a woman lives out of town and cannot make it to the centre, we will make every effort to make alternative arrangements to meet either in person or via a visual platform such as Zoom. If the pregnancy test is positive, we will also advise the woman to make an appointment with a qualified healthcare professional as we are not medically based and we will all offer to follow up with her and her partner to continue to offer emotional support as she walks through her pregnancy journey, whatever she has chosen. As I mentioned before, the Boundary Pregnancy Care Centre values every woman, man and child. Psalm 139, 14 to 16 says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book. This passage is often used to demonstrate how precious the unborn child is, that God is watching over us even as we form in our mother's womb. But as I read this passage, and particularly the words, all the days ordained for me, it is clear that this passage about, is about each and every one of us. We all developed in our mother's womb, including the woman carrying the unplanned pregnancy. All the days ordained for the mother and her growing child are written in his book. Neither one is more important to God. He loves them both equally. God in his infinite power could have created pregnancy any way he chose, but he opted for a woman to carry her pregnancy intimately, bonded together with her baby for nine months. What happens to one will impact the other, and by designing pregnancy this way, God has made it impossible for us to help one whilst bypassing the other. So often we hear the political polarizing terms of pro-life versus pro-choice. The problem is that it is at, it is, sorry, at its extremes, pro-life can place the baby's needs over the mother, as pro-choice 
favours the mother's needs over the child. As Christians, Psalm 139 demonstrates that both are equally precious in his sight. If God loves and values both the woman and child equally, then are we not called to work for the dignity and welfare of both? We do this by first loving the mother, giving her accurate information and listening to her needs. This supports the baby the best we can. Then we offer non-judgmental emotional support, walking alongside her whatever pregnancy journey she chooses. Because we value all life, Boundary Pregnancy Care Centre will not provide abortion services. However, in time, we do want to provide post-abortion care for anyone of any age, recognising that men and women may struggle with grief and loss following this decision, and that negative emotions can arise at any point in someone's lifetime. This includes grandparents and friends who may have been involved. This non-judgmental, pro-growth approach allows us to demonstrate God's truths, which in turn, through the Spirit's working, can lead to a transformed life. Jesus demonstrates this in the story of the adulterous woman in John 8, 2-12. As I read this passage, I want you to focus on how Jesus responds. And in the place of the adulterous woman, I would want you to place a woman who finds herself unexpectedly pregnant and abortion vulnerable. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man, sorry, I've got the wrong bit there, sorry. I'm on John 9, it's skipped a page, sorry. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placed her in the midst. They said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of, of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. As they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. So how does Jesus respond? Just like the religious leaders and the adulterous woman, we often make judgments without recognizing our own need for grace. Many Christians have been very vocal about the sins associated with sex outside of marriage and abortion. Yet we often fail to see that we as individual Christians and as a body can also play a part in the current realities. Lifeway research found that four out of 10 women who have had an abortion go to church regularly. And only 7% talk to someone in the church before making that decision. The two main reasons that the women gave were fear of judgment and lack of support for single parents within the church. These women felt like the adulteress before the Pharisees and chose to hide their pregnancy through abortion rather than being condemned for carrying it. Doesn't that break your heart? It certainly breaks mine. Sorry. Yet with God's help, we are perfectly positioned to move from holding the stone and offering little support into the place where Jesus stands, between the woman and those who condemn her, filled with grace and lots of support. Secondly, he diffused the life and death situation. As I've mentioned previously, when a woman is faced with an unexpected pregnancy, it can feel like her life has ended. At that moment, all her hopes and dreams for the future are gone, as she bears the brunt of shame for her pregnancy, even though she was not alone in it. 
Jesus demonstrates a model of calm, wisdom and protection in this piece. Taking the time with mum and dad, listening calmly, offering alternative scenarios and supporting whatever the situation allows parents to see hope and a future, as opposed to their life being at an end because of the pregnancy. Thirdly, Jesus tells the woman he does not condemn her. John 1, 16 to 17 says, For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law which was given to Moses, sorry, the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law of Moses is perfect and holy, but it cannot change us. It is only through the grace and truth that comes through Jesus that we are changed. Instead of highlighting sin, we can share God's truths, his love and grace, and what wonderful plans he has for people's lives. These truths and many others can set people free. Finally, Jesus talks about a transformed life. The Pharisees wanted to condemn. Jesus wants to transform. It is only in experiencing his grace first that any of us can recognize how much God loves us. That he sent his son to pay our debt so that we could be in relationship with him, adopted into his family. When we extend support and grace, it helps people see possibilities and start to dream. It breaks the power of fear, allowing parents to envision a new future for themselves and their children and it allows God's Spirit to bring about that transformation. Of course, option support and care of the post-abortion client is just the starting point. We also want to practically help those who make life-affirming choices. In time, we are hoping to extend the scope of the centre to include education programmes that support parents in areas such as parenting skills, sexual integrity, financial literacy and prenatal classes. We are also setting up a clothing closet containing lightly used maternity and baby clothes up to age two that parents can utilise as they complete programmes at the centre. There are many other amazing agencies in our communities and with our clients' consent, we want to refer them to other programmes to surround them with all the support and the help that they need for them to thrive. So what can you do? Number one is prayer. We want this to be led and run by the Lord for his glory. If you want to know more about what the centre is doing, we do produce a newsletter three times a year, which you can sign up for after the service. It will help keep you up to date with what we're doing at the centre and also keep you informed of our prayer needs and also our praises from the work we're doing. We'll also rely heavily on volunteers to run the day-to-day. -day. And we have brochures that kind of tell you all about the different kinds of volunteering that can be done at the centre, if you feel called to give us some of your time. We are actually looking for new board members at this time, and we'd love representatives from other towns. At the moment, all our board members are based in Grand Forks. Of course, running the centre does cost money. And if you feel called to support those facing an unexpected pregnancy in the boundary, financially, we are looking for both one-time donors and regular monthly donations to bless this ministry. Maybe you'd like to um, fill a baby bottle during our Blessings in a Bottle campaign, which we're going to run between Mother's and Father's Day. We're looking to raise $5,000 initially to set up the centre. And then our monthly running costs for 2022 are set around $3,342. To break that down, that's 67 people donating $50 a month, 167 people donating $20 a month, or 334 people donating $10 a month. I'd love it if you come and speak to either Lois or myself. Lois is just sat over there. After the service, if you have any more questions, and for those of you that are joining us from home, um, you know, if you have questions, please make that known and I will come and chat to you on a one-to-one -one, um, up at the front here. Thank you. Um, first, I just want to, I, I had, we had discussed that we'd ask questions afterwards, but I'm not going to do that because my concern is that you might get asked, what error are you allowed in your rivets? 
In other words, Daniel, after he's finished his presentation, um, your questions might get lost. So I want to get, get you fresh while it's fresh. But do you want to, Chris, do you want to take the kids or not? Okay. All right, children, you may go to Sunday school. Blessings on you, or more so than my wife, and whoever's helping. All right, so do you have any questions for Emma? Yes. Oh, just, just a second here. Hold it here. Mandy, Mandy, question here. Have you got any brochures with you? Yes, we do. Oh. Have your, your phone number and address and everything on We them? just got a phone last week, so uh -huh. it does, and it also has my email address on there, too. Right so on. Thank you. Any questions from Zoomy? Does that mean I did a good job? <laughs> well, the way I was going to say it is uh, you were like the opening act of a band, like a, band, a concert night, and all I can say is the main act is going to have a tough, tough job <laughs> beating you. Any other, are you sure there's no other questions? Neither right. like to know where they're oh. getting. Dave Duncan, go ahead. Eva would like to know where your center is going to be or where you're going to be meeting. Okay, we actually do have a building in Grand Forks right now that's on 3rd Street. I can't remember the exact number. Maybe Lois can. 7308. 7308 3rd Street. Um, for those of you that know Grand Forks, there is the opticians on 3rd Street. We are literally across the alleyway from there. So we do have a building. Thank you. Anyone else have a question? I just do want to say, I know for, for someone this might have touched a difficult piece in their own life. If that is the case, please do not walk away from today without contacting someone or contacting someone after the fact. Although we are not open yet as a centre, there are lots of other pregnancy care centres in Canada that are doing the same work and are based under the same national organisation that we are. And I don't want people to walk away from here if they're in need. Um, and I'm sure we can arrange for people to have someone to talk to if they need to. Uh, no, not yet. Just wait. <laughs> I hope you heard, like, they do not, they're not political. They're not, they are here for the people involved. And, and that's what they're here for, period. So, um, it, yeah, it's pretty amazing. What a great, what a great ministry. Um, can we take some time to pray? And again, Zoom land, you can pray a blessing on Emma. She's going to need it, right? It's hard to open a new group. Um, and for Lois, um, it, it, she, I know it's been a heart for hers and just for this ministry. Um, for everything that they need and um, what was the thing? Oh, board members. If anyone is interested from this area, if this is something that touches your heart, right? Um, maybe in, we could have an Indonesian representative from Indonesia. No. Um, but if you're interested, please talk. But could we just, if, if you'd like to just pray for them, um, just raise your hand here and Mandy will bring you the mic. But if you're on Zoom, just put yourself up mute and start to praying, please. Let's just pray for them. Thank you. Oh, Father, I thank you so much for Anna and Lois and this new ministry. It, uh, it's definitely a serious thing for me, and I just am thankful for your leading and your provision. I'm praying for continued wisdom for decisions that they have to make. But I pray for an anointing over the building where they are, that all who enter will feel your presence. Yes, Father, we ask you to bless this ministry and all the people that are going to be involved, including the babies, Lord. Such um, precious, precious babies, Lord, and we don't want to see one of them lost, Father. So we ask you to, uh, we thank you for being our provider, and uh, we ask you to provide for everything that this center needs, Lord, uh, including wisdom and strength, Lord, and discernment and 
finances and, and objects that mothers and babies need, Lord. Uh, I pray for counselors and uh, for people that can help take care of babies, Lord, when it's needed, uh, even if it's on site. So, Lord, and I pray for growth. Father, I do pray that this would extend out into other communities because we, we know that it is something that is needed. So we thank you, Father, and ask you to bless every aspect of this ministry in Jesus' name. Hey guys, I just want to pray for resilience and um, determination, Lord, as they face obstacles and resistance, too, because it's not always a popular idea this in this current climate in Canada, Lord, and just pray, um, yeah, that uh, Emma and Lewis and the volunteers and people there would really push forward, even when others in the area and, and <clears throat> neighborhood and stuff might not really like it, Lord, but you know um, it's needed, and people need it, Lord. the space like inside the building is there is there more than one room or yes is it there is actually if you come to the back afterwards we have a monthly donor thing that's called the village and there's actually a plan of our building as part of that so i can show you after the service so lord god i want to thank you for um, emma for lois and the others who have given who have been laboring in labor uh, pregnant, I should say, first, then labor, and now the the baby's been born and and has to grow up into maturity. Um, but we pray that this baby will always remain the have a heart of a child. Um, so, uh, Spirit of God, uh, anoint anoint them as as their heart of their ministry. Anoint them with love and understanding. May they never see in judgment even those who may not agree with them, but may they be filled with your love and trust you in everything else. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And this, we are her first presentation, right? So let's give a, come on, let's give a, a firm Emma. Woo! Thank you, Emma. And now for the main act. Okay, this is where you come in, kind of like a boxer, Daniel? No? All right. Actually, you're not the main act, buddy. You just are an act, a character, actually, more than Come on up, Aunt Daniel. Um, so for those of you who may or may not know, Daniel uh, is... Tied to me in relations. Come here, Daniel. Just come up here. What? Oh, you're getting the mic. Good, good. Um, he is an app on my wife's side, which means that that is. Um, and uh, he's going to tell us what he does. But uh, him and his family are pretty cool. Um, and um, that's it, I think. He's going to share about his ministry um, and then um, give us a bit of a, from the word as well. So thank you, Daniel. No, you're going to use that one. No. Oh, okay. Check. No, not there. Ah. Oh. No, not there. Okay. Wherever you want. Okay. Not there. <laughs> There we go. Perfect. Hello, hello. Check, check. 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 Good, good? Yeah. By the way, can you hear? Hello. Test, test. test. Yes. All right. <laughs> good. Um, thanks for having us. And thanks for sharing too, Emma. It was really cool to hear and hear what's going on with that in the area. Um, 
I think a lot of you probably know us or know of us a little bit. I think a lot of people on Zoom too, I recognize a few names there. Um, so we're not, I wasn't planning on going into detail, a lot of our, our stuff, but I'll just introduce ourselves. This is our family here. Um, my wife Lisa, and then Layla is our oldest daughter on the right. Timothy between us, Samuel beside Layla, and then our latest one is Peter, and he's just three, four months old, I think, later this week. So um, we are happy to be here. Thanks for letting us come, inviting us, Mark. And it's fun to be back in Midway, too. We have good memories here with grandparents that were in the manor, and um, Len and Jean are still here, too, so that's great. <clears throat> so we're serving with Wycliffe Canada in Indonesia, in Papua, Indonesia. And we aren't translators, neither of us, but what we do is we work with aviation. So we do, uh, I do aircraft maintenance, do the electrical work on airplanes, and um, it involves us navigation and radio and anything kind of electrical in that field. And where we serve is in uh, the far eastern part of Indonesia in a province called Papua. I think there's a slide that has one of our planes out in the mountains there. So it's kind of reaching out to really remote villages and locations where there's no road access or very limited road access. Um, so that missionaries and other pastors and other people can get in there, translators can get in there to um, further the, the spread of the gospel. So um, the next slide is a little bit about Wycliffe and their, their vision, their goal is to end Bible poverty, poverty in the world, which is really cool because there's, uh, I was looking at the shelf back there actually, I counted 40 Bibles back on your shelf here at church which is great, it's good. And I think I counted 11 or 12 different versions, so different translations, you could call it, of the Bible, just in this one building, which is, it's really cool, it's really neat. English has so many different, I think there's almost more versions of the Bible in English than there are languages that have, have had the full Bible in them, in the world, which is really interesting. It's not quite true, I think. I should probably know that stat, but I don't. But, <clears throat> So anyways, Wycliffe's vision is where people's lives are transformed by the Word of God. So they're really trying to end Bible poverty, having everyone in um, the world to have access to the scriptures, be it um, printed, uh, audio, video, whatever format they can get, um, that's what they're going for. The next slide has a few of the stats um, about Bible translation and what's kind of remaining. And so at, at this point, these are from 2020, they're not the most updated, there's about 2,000-ish languages left in the world that Wycliffe and their alliance has kind of surveyed that still don't have the complete scriptures. Actually, sorry, these 2,000 are, are languages that have potential need that haven't been started at all, period. Um, but the interesting fact, that it's hard to read on the slide, but it's only representing about 160 million people out of the population of the world. So it's great that the majority of these people in the world, out of the seven or so billion, do have access to the complete scriptures or large portions of it in their own language, in their mother tongue. So that's really neat, and that's kind of what we're working towards with Wycliffe Canada, but we are through aviation. So um, <clears throat> I was thinking to give a bit of an update over our last two years there in uh, Indonesia. So it's kind of a couple of the, the highlighted things I was thinking about what the last two years were like. There wasn't anything that was just un amazingly challenging or amazingly high either, honestly. It seemed very much like quite an easy period of time for us. Um, kind of kept building relationships with the church, with our neighbors, and at work I was doing different things than I expected, and I'll, I'll talk more about that. And obviously COVID came along, which was a little bit of a change, but actually didn't affect us as much as probably you guys or much as many other people in the world. But starting with Yajasi, um, I work at a lot of the days I look like that and kind of crouched under a, a cockpit under an instrument panel in a plane, doing wiring and fixing things, doing installs. But with uh, avionics, there's a lot of days too where I'm not super busy. There's a lot of, um, if there's not a big install, a big project going on, I actually have more free time than others. So <clears throat> this last two years when we were there, there actually wasn't a big project I was focused on. So there wasn't um, repairs to do or smaller projects. I was doing a lot of prep. We're doing some big upgrades uh, later this year. When I get back, we should start some autopilot upgrades for four of our planes. So that's going to be a really big job. So I'm doing a lot of prep for that when I had free time. I was also working a lot with um, HF antennas. So I don't know if you guys know much about uh, radio communication and frequencies and stuff. But one of the frequency ranges that we use is it's kind of like a citizen's band. It's kind of like a public band, 3 to 30 megahertz. 
And they use these, these massive antennas, and, and you can have you know 16 meter antennas or longer, as big as you can get is better actually. And uh, so I was, we actually put up a test antenna up on the roof with a 14 meter mast, and on top of a 14 meter building, trying to get really good receptions, we could communicate and track our planes around Papua, and it worked quite well. But then the ropes failed after about six months. We <laughs> had to take it down really quick. So, anyways, but it. So now we're when I go back, we'll have to decide if it's worth. Um, investing in a more permanent, a long-term solution. So anyways, that was another thing that took up a lot of my time, playing with HF antennas, and also training an um, apprentice. So right now, where we work in Indonesia, at a, a local mission called Yajasis, who Wycliffe partners with there, they, um, there's me as an avionics, and there's another guy, American, trained avionics tech. And then what we really want to do is get a local Indonesian guy to train with us, to be an apprentice with us. So this was our apprentice, Adi, and he's a really good guy, he has young kids, and so we, um, we became good family friends with him too, and we go to the beach and hang out with them. Really nice guy. He's a, he doesn't have any kind of avionics background, but he does have a bit of electrical engineering background. So um, it's good, because a big step into avionics is just understanding electron flow, and understanding resistors, and capacitors, and components. Um, if you have that base knowledge, it's much easier to step into it. So there's a lot of people that might have been interested, but they wouldn't have that base knowledge, it's just a lot bigger of a hurdle to start. So it was really good. He was, he was showing a lot of talent, a lot of improvement. But after we got back to Canada, actually, he's been having some health issues. And I think of a lot of it's from crawling around airplanes and crouching under them and going on them, like checking antennas and stuff. So he's actually been pulled out of avionics and he's back to doing lighter duties. Um, so it's actually something we can pray for is that Adit's health would improve so he could get back into doing the avionics with us. It's, it's a big, big, big help, and especially when we have these autopilot upgrades uh, later on in the year and stuff, it's really helpful to have a couple extra hands going on doing stuff. Another thing I was able to work on um, was starting to do, um, we worked on this new plane, so Yajasi there was given a plane, it's actually the same plane as the other photos, <laughs> but, and um, so it's not a new one, it's actually, I think it's a 1983 Cessna Caravan, that MAF has actually been using in Indonesia since probably the 90s. So it's been in Indonesia a long time. They were going to get rid of it, and then they ended up giving it to us. So for us, it's a big blessing. Um, it does take a, took a lot of upgrades. It had been sitting for about two years. So we're repairing stuff, putting in some different things, adding some things that our fleet uses that they didn't use. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's, it's an old beat-up plane, but it works good, and it's, it's safe. And I just actually started flying last month. They just finally got the permission and everything ready to go. It took about a year and a half to get everything ready to go and up to speed and get the permission from the government to use it. So praise the Lord, that's going. So I spent a lot of time working on that um, with Adi doing some tweaks and stuff. And then another one that I was doing lots of too was um, I started doing sheet metal projects at Tiajasi. So I used to, um, I don't really have a history of this, I kind of like, dabbling in different things and playing around when I have time. And so there's a guy, that, a pilot actually, that would do a lot of our sheet metal repairs for us. He just had a really good skill in it. Had been working with some guys back in the States. <clears throat> so I started helping him doing skin repairs, patching holes on the bottom of a horizontal stabilizer here, um, things like that. And I'm not really good at it, but I was kind of learning from him. I was enjoying it. And so that's part of why actually we're in Canada for this year in Kelowna, because I'm actually taking a course on sheet metal. So I'm going to hopefully get a lot better at this, so that when we go back, I can help, um, help a lot more. And actually, it turned out the timing was quite good, actually, because now the guy I used to work with has left Yajasi. They're back in the States now. They won't be returning. So um, it'll be much more helpful at Yajasi for me to do more sheet metal repair work in the future. So that worked out well. And another role um, I kind of stepped into with COVID because there were a lot less personnel around was doing a parts room managerial role at Yajasi. So I don't have any kind of background to this whatsoever. So this is a big stepping stone, but there's lots of coffee. You can see I got two coffee mugs going, a computer, and did a lot of emails, a lot of figuring out how to ship parts around the world and import parts. Luckily, there was already staff there. They already had lots of good systems in place. So a lot of it was just kind of supervising, approving, monitoring. There were a lot of new parts and things we had to figure out with a new plane, so that was a lot of learning for me as well. And um, yeah, it was kind of funny signing off on 
you know, shipping a quarter million dollar engine around the world back and forth. And, and I had to sign the approval for the engine overhaul, which was $300,000. And things that I've never dealt with, did not feel qualified to approve and sign off. But it was, it was fun and a lot of good learning. I'm not sure if I'll do that when I go back or not. But in, the, in an environment like that, we're often switching people around different places based on who's around and who can get in and who can't get in with, with visa situations and stuff. With COVID specifically over the last two years, <clears throat> so there have been a lot less people that were able to come in. Indonesia shut down all their visas for a while. Um, our province specifically banned any flights in and out for about three months. No people were allowed to fly in and out, only cargo for a while. So it was actually, um, it felt like, felt like for about nine months or so, people just kept leaving and leaving and leaving and no one was coming in. And uh, yeah, it's kind of an odd feeling, but praise the Lord, it's, it's opened up. People are coming back and, and able to help and come to serve. The Ajasi was able to keep doing their flights during that time with, most of them were cargo flights, but they were still allowed to do people once in a while. And um, <clears throat> there are a lot less missionaries, translators out in the field. But there's still work going on, a lot of it remotely. People are using more technology with Zoom and stuff. And so, yeah, praise the Lord. Translation's still going on. Ministry's still going on. There was one Bible dedication that we heard of during the time. Typically, people from Yajasi, would, if there's a Bible dedication going on, we would fly everyone in, and then we would get to go as well and, and join in the party. But I think the next slide is a, a picture of... Oh, there's us doing some COVID cleaning. Um, we sent in all these boxes and Bibles and stuff, but we actually couldn't go and attend. Um, but they had a, a New Testament dedication in one area. And, um, yeah, it's just encouraging to hear of, of things like that still going on when everything just seems so shut down. And um, there's also, yeah, so it's cool to be a part of that. And we could still do medical evacuations, a lot of medical needs out in the villages. They usually just have uh, what they call a little clinic, but it's not usually staffed. And then if there's anything serious, they usually call in a plane as quick as they can and they, they evacuate them out to a big uh, center where there's a hospital, things like that. So it's very common to see stretchers coming on the planes and um, all sorts of different injuries and stuff. So Yeah, so the, so Ujassi is um, lots of stuff going on there still. And our, the other kind of area that we've, we're trying to get involved with more as a family is our church. So we go to an Indonesian church there. It's all um, Indonesian people in the Indonesian language. So our, luckily, praise the Lord, our Indonesian skills are getting better so we can communicate better and things. Um, Lisa got involved playing drums on a worship band there. So she was getting into that and they were loving it. Um, they were real, they have like, feels like rock bands at church there some days. It's really fun, loud, and yeah, it's kind of cool. So Lisa's getting into that. And then I was helping out with the sound and all the Zoom stuff and technology, of course, during COVID. So... Um, yeah, it was neat to get involved in that way. We try to go to as many services and events and things as we can. This church is very outreach-minded, actually. They've, they've sent missionaries around Indonesia. They've sent missionaries in Papua in our region. They're trying to plant a church and staff a, a school out in the interior. So it's kind of neat to be involved in as a missionary in a church that's doing missions too, right? And it's, it's kind of cool. We're not, they don't rely on us really at all. We're just, we're just kind of members there helping out how we can. So it's kind of nice to feel like you know, we're part of a body that's doing local mission work as well. And it, yeah, it's, it's independent of us. It's really cool. So it's, um, <laughs> for the, they love services though. So between about Christmas Eve and New Year's Day, I think they have six services, six full church services that whole time. So we don't go to every one of those. We kind of pick a couple of them. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so otherwise you try and get involved in lots. But the kids, it's a bit harder, of course, because... Um, services are long and, you know, um, quite drawn out and very formal, actually, at this church. Um, but they have some good friends. They're getting to know more and more. And a lot of the friends actually speak pretty good English because English is getting more and more popular and it's taught right, around, right from elementary now, too. So our kids are able to communicate quite a bit with English. Their Indonesian is also getting better. Um, so it used to be really hard, but I think by the time we left, before COVID and everything kind of shut down, the kids were enjoying Sunday school, enjoying church and their friends and stuff. So, yeah, it uh, felt like it was going really well there. The, I think the next slide is a picture of our neighbors. So at home, in our community, another area where we've tried to get involved more is we have a lot of Muslims on our street. And uh, they're from a different province in Indonesia. And they kind of all stick together. And they're 
um, yeah, yeah, just a whole bunch of really friendly, nice people. And so we've been trying to focus on getting to know them better, trying to just stop by. In Indonesia, you just kind of just stop by and people are always sitting outside on their porch or relaxing. You just walk by and sit and chat for an hour or whatever. So we've been trying to do that more, we'll go out in the evenings and hang out and attend some of their events. This was, they invited us to go to the lake with them. So we went along to the lake with them one day. And I think the next slide is a funeral actually that uh, we attended. Again, funeral, uh, in, that, in that kind of culture there, weddings and funerals are almost like, come one, come all, anyone can show up kind of thing. So, um, but they, yeah, it's, it's kind of weird. We showed up, I gave people some rides to the funeral and stuff. And they, they seemed very appreciative and really, um, I went to I think the second funeral and, and they were pointing me out to some other people I didn't know. And they said, oh yeah, he was here last time too. And so it was kind of like, I feel, I feel like, like we're starting, starting to be accepted, accepted in, that, in that culture, in that group. So that's, that's another big prayer request for us is that we'll be able to share the gospel with those people because um, there aren't many, even the local Papuan Christians don't really integrate with them much. They're friendly, but it's not, it's not, it doesn't feel like people are reaching out to them. And it feels like Lisa and I, with our background, we have a lot more in common and it feels like we hopefully will have a bigger chance or a better chance to share the gospel with them. So... Yeah, that's another big uh, prayer request. We have other neighbors too. Some are <clears throat> Buddhist, some are uh, Christian, some are just, a lot are just nominal Christian, or uh, what do you call it? Um, yeah, Christian by name only, you know. So, yeah, so I think that was it for sharing about um, Indonesia. I think the next, that was the end of that one, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so anyway, that's kind of what we do, and uh, appreciate your guys' prayers and support. It's a big blessing to us. There are, um, if you guys want, there's some pictures or magnets at the back there if you want to grab one to pray for us. But we really appreciate that. So uh, I was thinking, um, <clears throat> Mark was uh, gracious enough to let me talk about Indonesia for half of my time. And then now I just have to talk about uh, a sermon for the other half of the time, right? So, so I'm good. <laughs> so, now I'd like to share from uh, the Word. And I was, I was thinking about what to share and I'm uh, right now I'm kind of reading through Psalm 107. I'm actually trying to memorize it because I kind of I kind of go in cycles. Sometimes I try and read and have devotions and then sometimes I try and focus on memorizing. So right now I'm kind of in my memorizing cycle. I'm at Psalm 107. I'm about halfway through it and um, the funny thing is when you memorize it, which is really important, I feel like it's really good to memorize scripture. When you memorize it, you often don't really think about it. So it's kind of like you're just blasting through it as much as you can. You repeat the words over and over. I've, I've read it hundreds of times the last few weeks. But then preparing for this, I was like, well, I guess I'll do Psalm 107. Start reading through it. And then you start thinking about it and kind of digesting it. And think, wow, yeah, I never even thought about that. Or what am I even memorizing? So I, there's been things that I've, I've learned the last few days here as I've been thinking about how to share this and how to talk about it. So it's been kind of cool. <clears throat> so this psalm, um, it's kind of about it's just about giving thanks to God, right? And seeing his power over everything and praising God for his help and how he's helped us. And, and you can use those to remember how he's going to help us too in the future. So it's kind of long, but I thought, you know what? I'm just going to read the whole thing. So That's not my whole sermon though, Mark. Don't worry. I threatened him. I said, I said, I might just read it and that'll be it, but I won't. We'll read it. It is long. I'm sorry. But then uh, I'll point out some things. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> We're with Wycliffe. We also love the word. It should be what everyone's thinking about all the time. Okay. <clears throat> is this, is there water? I think there's a water here. Can I steal one? Can I get one? Thanks. If, if that's possible. Oh, Lisa has one actually too. Just grab a sip. Thank you. I was thinking I didn't need water, so I didn't bring it up. Thanks. <clears throat> okay, Psalm 107. I'm reading from the NIV. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say this, those he redeemed from the hand of the foe, those he gathered from the lands, from east and west, from north and south. Some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. For he satisfies the thirsty and gives the hungry, oh sorry, and fills the hungry with good things. 
Some sat in darkness and a deepest gloom, prisoners suffering in iron chains, for they had rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. So he subjected them to bitter labor. They, they, bitter labor. they stumbled and there was no one to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the deepest gloom and broke away their chains. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. For he breaks down gates of bronze and cuts through bars of iron. Oh, sure. Sorry. Verse 17. Some became fools through their rebellious ways and suffered affliction because of their iniquities. They loathed all food and drew near the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent forth his word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. Let them sac sacrifice thank offerings and tell of his works with songs of joy. Verse 23. Others went out on the sea in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep. For he spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunken men. They were at their wit's end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. Let them exalt him in the assembly of the people and praise him in the council of the elders. Verse 33. He turned rivers into a desert, flowing springs into thirsty ground, and fruitful land into a salt waste because of the wickedness of those who lived there. He turned the desert into pools of water and the parched ground into flowing springs. There he brought the hungry to live and they founded a city where they could settle. They sowed fields and planted vineyards that yielded a fruitful harvest. He blessed them, and their numbers greatly increased, and he did not let their herds diminish. Verse 39. Then their numbers decreased, and they were humbled by oppression, calamity, and sorrow. He who pours contempt on nobles made them wander in a trackless waste. But he lifted the needy out of their affliction and increased their families like flocks. The upright see and rejoice, but all the wicked shut their mouths. Whoever is wise, let him heed these things, and consider the great love of the Lord. I like that ending. That's kind of cool. It's like, for wise, we will read this and heat these things. <clears throat> so any, there's lots of... Um, start, so thinking of that last verse, it says, consider the great love of the Lord. You know, heed these things. So I looked back and I made a note of all the, the things I could find that were kind of showing God's love, um, what we would consider good ways of showing God's love, kind things that he's done for us, um, such as redeeming us from the foes, delivering from distress, satisfying the thirsty, he fills the hungry, broke open our chains, sent his word and healed us, rescued from the grave, stilled the storm, gave a fruitful harvest, blessed with many children. Uh, there's many ways where, where God's love is shown throughout this song. And uh, I think this, I, I don't know who the author was, I couldn't figure it out. I didn't know and what I, the commentaries I read didn't say. But it's, uh, you can see how an Israelite, there's a lot of things in there that the Israelites went through and happened to the Israelites and how God brought them out and saved them and um, redeemed them. So it's, it's a lot of really clear things, clear imagery for the Israelites in there. But I was thinking there's, there's a lot of things too I, could, I can think about in my life that are actually similar, similar ways where I can relate to what the Israelites went through or relate to that a section of the psalm based on things God has done in my life or in the current situation in our lives. So I wanted to kind of highlight some of those. So like starting in verse 2, <clears throat> verse 1, give thanks to the Lord, sorry, for he is good, his love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say this, those he redeemed from the hand of the foe. So, I mean, the, the Israelites, they were redeemed from many foes at different times through their life. I haven't been chased and, and threatened, and people haven't tried to kill me, as far as I know, in my life. So I haven't been redeemed from the hand of the foe in that way. But really, just thinking about it, it's like Satan is my foe. Satan, he is our great enemy, and he has tried to take over my life, right? He has tried to threaten me, and he wants to kill me and wants to take me. And I have been redeemed from his hand. And, and Christ dying on the cross has redeemed me. And my sins have been taken, totally saved. All my debts have been paid. Um, 
And so I am one of these people in verse 2. I am one of the redeemed, that have been redeemed from the hand of the foe. Um, so it's kind of cool. It's like this psalm right away, right at the beginning, it's, it is talking to me. I feel like it's, it's up to me. I need to give thanks to the Lord, um, uh, just like the redeemed of, of Israel. So like verse 32, it said, share with others. Verse 22 said, with songs of joy, it's you need to verbally give thanks, not just in our hearts, but tell people too and share with people. Um, with the other redeemed, you know? In verse 4 to 9, the next section there, um, <clears throat> being wandering in a desert wasteland, finding no way, hungry and thirsty, they're lost, they're banished. Um, the Israelites could easily relate to that, obviously leaving Egypt, wandering in the desert, um, also possibly coming back from exile, trying to find their way back when they were scattered um, during some of the exile periods or their um, Assyrians or the Babylonians coming in. Um, they're out in the desert, they've given up all their possessions, they've run away, they have no food, they have no shelter, no money, um, no direction, no purpose. And um, it, yeah, again, in my life, I haven't been lost in a desert, I haven't wandered, but I have had times where I've had no direction, or I felt like I have no direction from God. I've had times where I've, I, I've never, I can't say I've ever really been poor. There's been times where I've, I've thought, well, there's no real future, uh, don't, other, based on the resources I have and what's coming in, this isn't going to work out. And, and God has brought us through that time. And uh, I was thinking specifically of um, kind of God, how God led us into Wycliffe and led us into going to Indonesia. And uh, in terms of provision, it was kind of a funny story when we went down to North Carolina to do our training for six months. We had just joined Wycliffe, and I think we were at like 10% support or something very minor. We had given up our job. And uh, we asked, oh, can we go, even though we're at 10% support? And they said, well, if you think you can survive while you're there, yeah, go for it. So we said, ah, sure. We, we prayed. We trusted God. We thought we'd go. Before this, though, we, had, we actually had quite a bit of savings. So we had um, we were saving up to buy a house. So we had a down payment saved up, actually, right before this. But Lisa and I, we, we had prayed about it. We talked about it. And we thought, I don't remember the words, but I remember thinking, or we, we both agreed at the, on this too, that, you know what, we don't want to go and have this, this backup plan or this, this amount of money set aside that we can always fall back on if everything falls through. Um, so we had peace about it and we actually gave it away. So that, that lump sum was gone. And so when we, we went down to North Carolina, it was, it was literally our, our paychecks were done. We had very little support and we didn't have this fallback plan anymore. And it was kind of a cool feeling. It was kind of like, God, you're going to have to make it work or else it's not going to work. <laughs> we'll be going back begging somewhere. Um, so anyways, it was, it was neat to see how God provided. And one of the ways, one of the biggest kind of ways that stood out was they have a, a bread dock there, a place where they um, get uh, expired food or nearly expired food from the stores around the mission there. And um, they would kind of gather them and you could go get free food. So, of course, we were there every week, right, um, getting our food maybe twice a week. And um, so we've got a lot there. And there's frozen chicken there. It turned out there was like frozen chicken. And we're like, this is awesome. We got our bread, our chicken, some vegetables are a bit wilted, but you know, you can eat, you know? And it was like God was providing for us. And it turned out later we heard that they'd never ever had frozen chicken there. It was, it was totally new. They'd never had that before. And then right before we left, we were there about six months. I think the last month or so, the frozen chicken stopped. And, and it was just like, ah, God is totally providing our manna and our quail, right? We were, we're at this time, we was like, yeah, we can scrape by barely, but we wouldn't be buying much chicken or, you know, all this stuff. But, um, yeah, God totally provided, you know, and we were never on the brink of starvation, honestly. But, um, yeah, it was, just, it was just a really cool, cool way where we had, we had thrown it all away and thought, all right, God, it's up to you now. We want to see it work. And it worked. You know, God, God totally came through. So that was kind of cool. I was kind of thinking of that when I was reading 4 through 9 there about how the Lord led them and he satisfied the thirsty and he filled the hungry with good things and we were filled. Verses uh, 10 to 16, talking about rebellion and uh, enslavement, being rescued, um, darkness and the deepest gloom. Again, I, have, I haven't been in jail yet, at least not that I'll tell you. Mark would probably know if I had. Um, so yeah, it was kind of like, well, okay, obviously this doesn't apply to me. I haven't been in iron chains before and stuff. 
But <clears throat> thinking about it, darkness and deepest gloom and chains and iron can, can mean so much more, right? The Jews, obviously, they had been in those places, right? In the time of the, the judges, they had constantly been uh, rebelled, enslaved, captured, you know, freed again by a judge back and forth, or they were taken in chains to Babylon or in the exile, right? Very real for them. But for me, what I was thinking, the way it kind of related to my life is just thinking of sins, right? A, a sin that enslaves, an ongoing sin, an addiction, a, a habit where you, you just keep sinning over and over again. You're falling down, whether you're trying or not, you're deliberate or not. You're just stuck in bondage in this, in this sin, and it's a chain that's got you. And, um, <clears throat> and in verse 13, it says, Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, right? And that's so often how it is for us, too. We get stuck in something. We become totally enslaved. And there's, there's no way out. And uh, we just keep doing the sin over and over or something. And then we finally cry out. And in my life, at, I mean, that's, again, I have a, a direct correlation with this. There was a, a time in my life where I struggled with pornography for a long time. And it was the same thing. It's shameful. It's, it's uh, a sin. You don't want to. And then you're back in it. You don't want you back into it. And, but you don't cry out to God. You don't tell people. It's very secretive. And, and Satan has power over you in that. And the, and the chains were, were tight. And then finally, I also cried out to the Lord. You know, I finally you just give up and you're so upset. You, you cry out to the Lord. Um, yeah, and then he brought me out of it, you know, through my pastor and counseling and stuff. And it's, it's such a reason to praise God, give thanks to the Lord for bringing me out of the darkness and the, the gloom and the chains, you know. Um, it, it doesn't have to be pornography, though. There's other things that, that people can be bound in, can be, be held in those chains by. But, but for, for me, me that's, that's, that's how I related to it. And I think it's, um, yeah. yeah. And, and, and it's amazing that God doesn't just ignore us at that, that point. But it, it's, long, it's a long period of coming out of that too. And God just walks with you through it the whole time. <clears throat> Breaks down gates of bronze, cuts through bars of iron. So it's really something I want to praise God for and give thanks to God for, for that. And um, he can do it for anyone. Verse, verses 17 to 22 are very similar. Uh, to the previous ones. So it's, it, to me, it, it seemed very similar. I, I probably won't spend much time on it here because uh, same rebellious ways, suffered affliction because of their iniquities, drew near the gates of death, and they cried out, and he rescued them. And let them sacrifice thank offerings, tell of his works with songs of joy. <clears throat> so, yeah, very, very similar, but God is still there to rescue us. Going to verse Recording stopped. Recording stopped. Verse 23 is uh, probably my, the part I think is the coolest part of the psalm, the, the coolest imagery of the waves and the ships and stuff. I've always thought ships and, and storms and things were so cool. Um, thinking of the, the Jews back then, it was kind of like they, didn't, they weren't really known as a seafaring nation, but they were 